to the Central House, to the Bartlett School of Environment, Energy and Resources, and to this joint event organized by two of its four institutes, the UCL Energy Institute and the UCL Institute for Sustainable Resources. I'm Paul Eakins, and I'm director of the UCL Institute for Sustainable Resources, and uh, got Andrew Esther in here as the director of the new Bartlett School. So we're all quite excited about these new developments that are taking place here. We're immensely lucky tonight to have a lecture from Professor Jim Watson. Jim is director of the UK Energy Research Centre, which has just entered its third five-year phase of activity. Very unusual for the research councils to give a third phase to one of its centres, and it was Jim who became director uh, last year who guided uh, the centre through uh, that uh, fairly uh, tortuous and dramatic process as the research councils were determined to see whether they really wanted to give a third phase to the centre and thanks uh, largely to Jim they decided that they did and UCL uh, Energy Institute and ISR are very glad to be core partners in this third phase of UKIRK. Before we get into the business of the evening, I'm just going to point out the fire escapes in Central House. I probably need to put my specs on again to do that. So that's the door at the back there and out where you came in. Jim will talk for about 45 minutes. Okay. Yeah, at the moment. And we'll then yeah. have questions, and I've no doubt there will be lots. And after that, when things seem to be running down or people are getting thirsty, we will adjourn for some refreshments on the first floor. And we very much hope that all of you, or as many of you as can, will join us. If you all join us, given that we've probably got quite a crowd here, we shall be comf uh, pretty cosy up there. But um, there we go. Uh, please do come if you can stay. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, give you some more details about that later. Um, we've got uh, some volunteers from UCL, so thank you very much for being here, Vanessa, Ellie, um, and we do televise uh, all our talks and they go on the website, so thank you very much, Melissa, for uh, dealing with that. And um, it seems that we're likely to have someone on the reception desk this evening until 8 p.m., which means that when you finished the rece when you finished refreshments upstairs around about 7.30, you can just let yourselves out instead of having to be let out by a member of staff. Let me tell you a little more about Jim. He was director of the Sussex Energy Group from December 2008 to January 2013, and it was then that he became uh, UK director. He's got 20 years of research experience on climate change, energy, and innovation policy, although he doesn't look old enough to have had 20 years for that, but You're nevertheless he has. He frequently advises governments in the UK and abroad, and indeed I think is one of the most distinguished energy policy academics in the country. And he's been a specialist advisor to three UK parliamentary select committees. There's lots more on this list, but I'm sure you're keen to get onto the presentation, as probably is he, and so I'm going to turn you straight over to him. Uh, Jim, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> you shouldn't clap t t until I've finished, because you don't know whether you're going to enjoy it yet, but uh, thank you all the same. And thank you particularly for the kind introduction um, and the kind words about uh, UK Energy Research Centre Phase 3. I have to say that I did rely on a, a whole team of people to uh, successfully land the money for our third phase, not least Paul, who's uh, decided to uh, say that it was all my effort, which isn't uh, particularly fair on himself, never mind everyone else. So. Uh, Thankful to colleagues for that. Um, so Paul has done the introduction about UKIRK, so I'll just get straight into the, um, the, the substance of the talk. This is very much based on a uh, project we did under the last phase of, of UKIRK, which was published uh, six months ago in April. Um, called UK Energy Strategies Under Uncertainty. There's a, a report and all sorts of detailed outputs from that project available on our website. I brought on a couple of copies of the, uh, the synthesis report, which brings it all together. 
um, in case anybody wishes to follow up on that afterwards. The, the main aim of the report was to, I think as this, the title of the talk uh, suggests, is to really look forward not into the very long term. We're used to looking to 2050, and certainly in the academic community and increasingly in the policy community too, but actually look at the more medium term, the period to 2030, which is only now 16 years away, and really focus on what the key uncertainties are with respect to attainment of our climate goals. So there's been lots of work to set out um, how we might meet particular targets by 2050 and interim targets by around 2030 in terms of emissions, uh, what kind of changes might be necessary uh, both to technologies and infrastructures but also potentially to policies and institutions. But clearly there's a lot of uncertainty. Predicting the future and how those things might play out is very difficult. So the aim of this project was not only to understand those uncertainties but actually to explore ways in which those uncertainties might be tackled. In some cases, it's a case of understanding them better. In other cases, you might actually be able to do things to reduce those uncertainties or mitigate them. So really, that's the essence of what I'll be talking about. Along the way of this project, it started in um, uh, uh, two years earlier, in 2012, one particular branch of uncertainty became more and more important um, and, uh, in a sense, made the project more salient. But it wasn't really the area of uncertainty that was built into the project from the start. And this is the area of political uncertainty. So energy policy has become more political and more contested over certainly the last year, if not two years. And I think that adds an extra layer of uncertainty, which has had an impact on some of the detailed areas we've looked at through the project, particularly, for example, investment in power generation, which I'll, I'll touch on as I go through. So I'm going to talk about, briefly, I'll talk about the context, um, both the uh, if you like, the technocratic uh, version of why we're doing the project, but also the political uncertainty version of why we ended up doing the project. Um, I'll talk a bit about the aims, but then I'm really going to walk you through some of the key uncertainties we identified and what they mean um, in practice. And then critically, we were also brought back by many of our uh, advisors from uh, non-academic worlds to keep our focus on not only describing the, the complexity of the world and how uncertain it all was, which is a tendency of academics, but actually what might be done to, uh, on Monday morning to actually mitigate some of those uncertainties if you're involved in policy or if you're involved in actually building new infrastructures. And then some conclusions. So here is uh, first what I describe as the technocratic version of our rationale. Um, this is a chart from the Committee on Climate Change that they've used repeatedly through their reports over the last few years, basically describing the pathway that they've advised government that the UK needs to take in terms of reduction of our emissions. So it starts in 1990 on the left-hand side, which is our baseline year, and ends in 2050 on the right-hand side. Um, the bars are broken down into the various sectors and sources of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's greenhouse gases, not just CO2. Um, and clearly there's an emphasis, because the Committee on Climate Change have given detailed advice on this period, on the medium term, the period through the 2020s to 2030. Um, and clearly, because I've, I've added in the box, the box isn't from them, but I've added in the box to say, well, you know, the trilemma is um, something that everybody now emphasizes. So it's not just climate change that we need to uh, tackle. There's actually a need to pay attention to energy security, which I've given the shorthand keeping the lights on, although it's about a lot more than keeping the lights on, and also keeping bills down energy affordable. And clearly that has come up the agenda over the past year or so. So there's a need to balance all three of these objectives. And that's partly why the political uncertainty, I think, has become heightened over the last year or two. Um, I think the only other thing I'd note in this chart, because I'm going to talk about it a bit later, is what happens to this light blue um, block. It, that's the one that reduces quicker, um, earlier than all of the others, which is the power sector, emissions from the power sector. So in common with many other analyses, not least those done here for Ukirk by uh, Paul and uh, colleagues, um, the power sector often decarbonizes first when you're looking for a, a least cost pathway to meet these longer term policy targets. So that's the, what I might call the technocratic version, but here's the uh, more the, the political version um, of, of um, the rationale. And I think what we've seen, and I, I actually did a little bit of uh, 
uh, mining of government policy documents over the last couple of uh, days just to confirm this, a real shift in the language that's used to describe what the energy policy goals are for the UK, and a particular shift in the ordering of the priorities of the trilemma. So if I go back to the 2007 Energy White Paper, which is now quite a few years old, um, it only talked about two objectives and two challenges, security and climate change, and it was very clear that climate change had been most important and security was starting to come up the agenda affordability wasn't really emphasized at the top line of those energy policies but I was really struck coming forward to the about a year ago Michael Fallon who's no longer energy minister is now Secretary of State for Defense giving a very explicit ordering of priorities which is something that ministers for the last few years haven't really done they've always said or not always but in, have commonly said that there are three objectives and we want to meet them all simultaneously and they're equally important whereas he actually said well climate change actually comes third in the list and it's only playing our part, as it says here, in combating climate change. And actually what's more important is security and affordability. But here's the official DEC annual energy statement version from a few weeks ago. And again, it uses a similar order, although it actually puts uh, affordability first, energy security second, and climate third. So the interesting things you can glean from the way in which these things are talked about. And that's created quite a bit of uncertainty, I think, from, for, for many people trying to implement solutions, because for, for a long time, climate change was thought to be more, most important. Because once you start advocating that security or affordability are more important, then perhaps you reach different conclusions about what you would like to see happen. So hence, much of this has translated into a lot of different controversies, and I've just used uh, four examples here which have been picked up by the media over the past year of areas that have become more controversial, and so hence there's more political uncertainty about energy. Uh, top left, the whole discussion about Russian uh, gas, even though we don't use very much, it hasn't stopped David Cameron, our Prime Minister, talking about uh, needing to break free of Russian gas and actually uh, to back fracking in the UK, even though we still don't know how much that might contribute to our energy supply. Um, there's been a standoff between companies and government about investment and companies warning about um, the competition uh, in investigation because of high prices and saying, well, if the investigators, then we might not invest as much and you might have blackouts on your hands. Thirdly, Ed Miliband's labour price freeze uh, proposal uh, about a year ago, um, which um, really uh, sent the government into a spin and a very quick backpedalling on some policies and with some regrettable consequences uh, with respect to energy efficiency, for example. And then finally, attacks by some in the coalition government on, uh, or at least some backbenchers on wind farms, onshore wind farms, which are probably at the moment the cheapest form of renewable energy we have, and yet uh, for some they're seen as unacceptable. So real tension there between the low carbon and the, the cost uh, dimensions of energy policy. So this backdrop has been quite important as we went through our work and has become more, more important since we finished it. A little brief bit about the, uh, the, the project itself and, and what we did. Um, there's actually 30 researchers involved in it, although I only put three more names on the front slide. They were the ones that worked with me to edit the final report. Uh, ten commissioned papers, you can look at all those at your leisure on the website, and uh, many of them are coming out in another version in an academic journal as well. But this report that I waved around earlier is really for more general audiences. And as I said, the aims are here, both to understand the uncertainties and then to identify the strategies. So I don't think I need to say any more about that. I mean, what we did, we decided to do as we were starting to pull everything together is just thinking about, well, how do we want to bring together um, a disparate set of work that had gone off looking at a whole area, whole different areas of energy. For example, looking at adoption of electric vehicles or investment in power generation or how networks for heat might change. And what we did, we decided to use the Committee on Climate Change's fourth carbon budget pathway, which basically takes you through into the late 2020s, as I showed earlier, as a point of reference, a common point of reference. So we got all of the authoring teams to comment on what were the uncertainties they found and how might they relate to the kind of things that the Committee on Climate Change wanted to happen to meet that fourth carbon budget pathway. So that was the, the reason for focusing on that. It was a way of bringing everybody together to look at something common. 
We did spend some time looking at methods for appraising uncertainty as well, and that fed into partly to our framework for bringing everything together, and I'll come to that towards the end. Um, really reviewing how do you deal with uncertainty for different types of problems. If you're doing the energy system as a whole, for example, you might want to engage in some quite broad scenario analysis to understand the different ways the energy system might change and to decide which courses of action might be robust to those. But if you're interested in uncertainties around the cost of a particular technology, you would probably do something a much more focused and use much more focused methods. We then looked at a series of what we call instrumental uncertainties, specific bounded parts of the energy system, which we investigated, and that was done by colleagues from a number of different institutions within Newkirk, um, looking at power, heat and transport. I'll go through those in a moment. We looked also at a, a set of what we, in the end, realised were more systemic uncertainties. These are uncertainties which have more pervasive potential consequences. The things like natural resource uncertainties could not only have impacts on, say, the power sector, they may also have impacts on heating and on transport. Similarly for public attitudes and acceptance of particular technologies and strategies, but also this whole area of ecosystem services, how energy systems and our activity impacts on the environmental uh, system. And that was also a systemic uncertainty. And what we also did a, a little bit along the way, and this is something that we will certainly do more of as we get th into our next phase of UCO, which we're just embarking on, is actually analysing also the alternative pathway. Because there's a temptation in some debates to say, well, this low carbon pathway is all very well, but it's expensive, it's complicated, and what about this other pathway, which often people mean uh, more emphasis on gas and so on, uh, not doing all this expensive low carbon technologies, but actually we feel that that pathway hasn't been subjected to the same level of scrutiny, that alternative pathway, as some of the low carbon pathways. Now we did do some uh, referencing of that in this work, but that's something we'll do more of in the future. So now I'm going to walk you through using a couple of pictures, which hopefully are understandable, um, uh, to, um, to show you the kind of uncertainties we have identified, but also and give you a bit of detail about those. And then I'll move on to talking through a few of them and what kind of strategies we suggested for trying to manage or overcome them. So as with the Committee on Climate Change, we're going to start with the power sector, not because it's the only part of the energy system that, that matters, but because actually it's particularly important in the short to medium term for reducing emissions um, uh, in the period to 2030. So clearly power sector decarbonisation is extremely important for most scenarios that you can find out there. And we focused on two sets of uncertainties. I'll put, put them both up at the same time to start with. One was around investment and finance, which is discussed quite a lot. You know, the questions about whether we can get enough investment capital into the UK power generation sector to build the carbon capture and storage, the renewable power plants and potentially nuclear power plants over the next few years. That's a big question that people debate. But along the way, we also identified what I've... Uh, loosely termed wrong type of capital. In other words, that there is another uncertainty. It's not just about the amount of capital out there. It's actually whether the capital and the type of investor that has that money would actually invest in the UK power sector. Would they actually prefer to invest in uh, another sector in the UK or another country entirely? So there's a whole dimension of the debate about investment, which is not really about how much money is out there. It's more about what kind of money is it and who is lending it to what. And that's something we looked at in great detail. The second related set of uh, uncertainties is about technology. Will those technologies that we need, and you can develop all kinds of different scenarios of different mixes of technologies to meet targets, there are choices to be made, but will they actually reduce in cost and will they actually be ready commercially to deploy in sufficient numbers to meet those targets? So we're focused on technological progress on the right-hand side and then costs on the left-hand side. So all of those four uncertainties impact on power sector decarbonisation. And I'm just going to spend a couple of slides just expanding on those before we move on. So first on investment, this uh, slide you probably can't see all the detailed numbers and the letters from the back there. It starts in 1993 and it goes forward to 2013. So everything to the left of the dotted line is history. It shows the amount of capital expenditure in the UK electricity sector in each year um, over that period. So you can see on the far left uh, quite a lot of blue bars and that's the dash for gas, the uh, investment in uh, combined size 
cycle gas turbines throughout the 1990s. As you get later on, you see investment in renewables starting to come through. The green is wind, for example. And you're starting to see, contrary to some, what some people think, quite an acceleration of investment over the last couple of years. And that's really the big boom in investment in renewables. Um, I have read newspaper editorials claiming that there is no investment in the electricity sector, but clearly they hadn't looked at those figures before writing those editorials. The reason that uh, 2013 is quite small is, is it's only partial year of data, so it's not because everything suddenly stopped. When you go to the right, this is a combination of different uh, bodies' projections of the investment necessary to meet particular targets. So it includes Committee on Climate Change, it includes uh, Ofgem, which are clustered here and here for 2020 and here for 2025. Um, I think there are some national grid uh, numbers in there. So as, as you go forward in time al along, you're getting further forward in time, 2020, 2025, 2030. Overall, and that's why we've put in these horizontal lines here, the picture is that the amount of investment annually required goes up over time, but it's not the very large leap that you might think given the, le the rates of investment that there have been in the last few years, but certainly rates of investment do need to accelerate and increase, and um, particularly when we get in from the 2020s into the 2030s. Clearly different studies will have different assumptions, so they will differ in terms of what type of uh, technology, but also how much investment will be needed. But I think I really want to stress that second point I mentioned earlier, that actually we concluded in the end, and the people who did this paper concluded, that actually shortage of money is not the issue. There's plenty of money out there to invest. Um, lots of companies post-2008 were actually sitting on money uh, and, and saying, well, we haven't got places to invest it in because we're not sure that the market is there or the opportunity is right or the risk-reward profile is right. And actually, what, one of the, perhaps the bigger issue, or at least an equally important issue, is actually the, um, the risks associated with making investments in uh, large-scale, low-carbon power stations in the UK. And those are much more risky investments to many of those investors than the traditional investments they put money into, especially when you start talking about institutional investors and pension funds who are used to investing in fairly safe, fairly low risk, but fairly low return, long-limbed assets like water grids and that kind of thing. Whereas here we're talking about emerging technologies, some of which haven't been commercially proven, and they look much more risky. So one of the issues is, can we develop the policy framework to a point where those risks are manageable so that some of that money then flows to the UK power sector? And certainly, uh, many people we talked to uh, were of the opinion that although the U U gov UK government's policy package for electricity is helping, there's still a considerable amount of political risk about it in order to, uh, that, that has to be taken into account before investment decisions are made. So we really ended up concluding that it may need more further work looking at that policy framework before much of that investment can flow. Second and related on technology, we split it into three sort of levels. Uh, there's certainly some techno-economic uncertainties, as it says at the top, for individual technologies. So will they actually improve their technical performance and their cost performance over time? For example, carbon capture and storage is only just being uh, deployed commercially at power stations in North America. It hasn't yet happened in the UK. Um, costs will be high to start with, that's probably guaranteed, but will costs fall as more experience is gained? Much depends on how far uh, governments in other countries are actually going to continue to support those technologies. You could say the same for offshore wind, which of course has got much further down the track. Then there are prog programmatic uncertainties which are related and really relating to areas where technology really needs policy support. So uncertainties about, for example, UK carbon capture and storage spending. At the moment, the current government is still committed to put a billion pounds into carbon capture and storage. Will that money survive the election that's coming in six months' time? That's a very big question and it depends who gets elected afterwards, I suspect. So that's where some of those programmatic uncertainties come in. And then finally, system integration uncertainties, because clearly all of these technologies are not viewed in isolation. They've got to fit together in systems. The power system is going to change radically if, if many of these technologies are deployed, not just on the supply side, but on the demand side. So there's a whole set of uncertainties about integration of those technologies together, many of which can no doubt be overcome, but it's certainly a very different power system we're envisaging to the one that we inherited. So on that, one of our headline conclusions really was that the UK, in common with some other countries, is really trying to do an all of the above policy with respect to power generation technologies, which is quite a brave and ambitious thing to do, uh, certainly for a medium-sized economy like the UK, because the amount of not, not only 
uh, financial commitment, but political commitment you need to commercialize any one of these technologies is substantial at a time when uh, public budgets are tight. Trying to do them all at once and then saying, well, in the 2020s, we'll find out which are cheapest, is very, very hard to achieve. Um, and certainly, we think at some point, some choices will need to be made. Of course, being academics, we say those choices ought to be evidence-based. Uh, whether such uh, calls will be heeded um, is anybody's guess. But certainly, that's, that's what we concluded there. So back to my diagram. So we've got those two sets of uncertainties. Clearly, policy and politics are absolutely key. So that's why I've added that in there. I'm just going to put up the, uh, the systemic uncertainties to this because all of them have an impact on power se sector decarbonisation. Clearly public attitudes do, um, you know, which vary according to what technology you're talking about and also vary according to whether people are talking about a, a technology being deployed in their backyard or a technology being deployed somewhere else in the UK, so their attitudes uh, differ there. Clearly many of them will have impacts on ecosystem services, I'll say more about that in a moment, and on bioenergy resources, bioenergy could be and already is starting to be quite a major component of our renewable strategy in the UK but that's not without controversy and without potential impacts the import of uh, wood from North America is certainly controversial uh, you know for burning in large-scale power stations so going on to ecosystem services, I won't go into this in great detail. For those of you who don't know what an ecosystem service is, I've uh, put together a series of pictures because usually uh, taxonomies of these uh, split them up into four different groups. Um, first, supporting services, things like uh, photosynthesis. Um, uh, provisioning services, which are things like what the environment does for us in terms of resources. So there I've got a biogas holder. We do equally talk about other renewable resources or water resources there. Regulation and maintenance, I've given you the carbon cycle as an example of that. And then cultural services, that's uh, I think members of my family struggling up a mountain in the Lake District. Um, but as an example of amenity services we all get from the environment um, at certain times. So all of these are clearly important to us in very different ways and could be impacted by the development of energy systems in a different way and are already impacted of course by the energy systems we have. So we went through the different ecosystem service categories, they're down the left hand side here. This is just an example of the output because I wouldn't have time to go through all of it uh, with you tonight. Um, and along the top it shows some of the case studies we, our team looked at. So a team did basically a very big meta literature review looking at what the literature says about impacts on ecosystem services of these three either uh, four either technologies or types of resource so biomass gas nuclear and wind I don't think it's worth going into the precise shares of all the pie charts because actually their headline was quite a simple one which is that the evidence base is patchy and weak so actually it's quite hard to draw hard and fast conclusions about the ecosystem service impact of many of these technologies compared to another. But these do range from a green, if we have any greens on the diagram, there's a few of significant positive impacts um, all the way through to conflicting impacts and inconclusive evidence. There's a similar chart in our report for UK based impacts because this um, analysis looked all the way up the supply chain. So it didn't just look at the wind turbine in the UK, if you're going to build one here, but also the impacts of all the steel and the other resources used to build that wind turbine and those impacts in other countries clearly comes into play. So as I say, the headline really is, although there's quite a bit of evidence out there and in some areas there's quite a lot of literature, uh, in many, particularly emerging areas like um, unconventional gas, shale gas as it's popularly called, then um, the evidence base is actually quite thin. So there isn't that much there on which to base the kind of judgments we may need to make. So one of our conclusions there is, well, there's a really clear need to strengthen that evidence base uh, to make more informed decisions. So back to my diagram again. Um, I'm going to connect now to the other bits of the energy system. So I've done the power sector, now I'm going to go to uh, heating and transport, which were an equally important part of the work we did. Clearly, what happens in the power sector has big impacts on both the electric vehicle effectiveness, which is EV effectiveness there, but also the effectiveness of heat pumps. If you're going to use those technologies to decarbonize transport and heating, respectively, it does matter what the power sector's done. It's no good putting all those things in if your power sector is still a high carbon power sector. So clearly, there are linkages through, then 
my thing works, to transport and heat decarbonisation. So I'm going to hand over to a, my second diagram. Uh, it's the only one I've got, so you've only got to hold two in your head at the same time, uh, looking at the heat and transport sectors respectively. So I'll start with heat. Um, and I've already put on here what happens to electricity decarbonisation impacts on it, but also what happens in terms of heat pump performance, because there's a, a lot of a discussion really about how far heat pump performance uh, might improve, and some people's experience so far hasn't been as good as the design of those heat pumps for various reasons, but clearly there is some way to go to uh, potentially make those better, so that will have an impact on how well you can do. But certainly, um, uh, along with many other uh, analysts, we've pointed out that if you go for heat pumps in a very big way, then you do run into some quite big implications for the power sector. And certainly under some scenarios, you're talking about increasing the capacity of the power sector by quite a large percentage, perhaps 40 or 50 percent, because of the very high, high peak you get in heat demand. Uh, and I'm sure people in this building will know that better than I do. So certainly there are some very big feedback effects for the power sector if you go for heat pumps, particularly those that have the efficiency of today's heat pumps rather than ones which might be improved. So that's one point we emphasised. A second really is that how much you do on heat sector decarbonisation really depends partly on how good you are at making progress in energy efficiency. Again, something that many people in this building spend a lot of time focusing on. And I think this sort of rather supply side look at things, you can sort of miss that. And actually looking at energy efficiency first is much more important perhaps from an economic point of view, but also from a point of view of minimising the amount of low carbon infrastructure you need. So that certainly got picked up in the kind of analysis we did of heat. And then, of course, the other point is that electricity isn't the only way to decarbonise heat. Although it's become very fashionable, certainly over the last five years or so, to say this is the prime pathway, this is the, the main way we see uh, heat being decarbonised is by having low carbon electricity. I think there's been a certain amount of rethinking of that, and certainly among some analysts, both in the government, in the Committee on Climate Change and others, uh, the ETI, for example, thinking more about other ways in which low carbon heat could be generated, perhaps combined with low carbon electricity, has become a bit more common. So looking at a more of a range of options there. So we factored that in too. And part of that could be about district heating, which is the final, I think, blob I've got on my heating chart. Um, and that's not really about developing a new technology, but certainly district heating isn't something we do very commonly in the UK. So it's actually about developing the business model, as we've written there. How do you make it work from an investment, uh, consumer acceptance, etc. point of view? I'm just going to show you a couple of slides from the detailed we work we did on household energy demand. Um, uh, this was done by Nick Eyre col and colleagues at University of Oxford, um, really to try and explore in a bit more detail this whole point about how, you know, how heat might be decarbonised and what are the different ways to do it besides the central scenario which has emerged from many analysts over the last few years of electrifying everything. So we've got that scenario in there. So this is electricity demand for UK resi residential heating. It's got a minimum policy intervention or business as usual line, which is in blue there. So that's the amount of electricity and then just rising over time to take account of increases in household size and household numbers. Um, but if you go to electrification of heat, clearly there's a very big impact on the amount of electricity you're going to need. And I think that green line illustrates that. But by contrast, they put in two other scenarios uh, using the model they had, saying, well, actually, we could have a more locally based um, um, uh, scenario um, with some electrification but actually with more biomass, locally sourced biomass, more district heating and so on. And then their deep balance transition, um, actually that's a, just a very aggressive energy efficiency scenario, doing everything you can to reduce the demand in the first place rather than uh, meeting a higher demand. So that's why that line goes particularly low as you get towards 2050. And you can see the impact of those uh, lines. This is a, a similar curve, but for gas demand this time, for heating, not electricity demand. So you can see the minimum policy intervention. We basically stay as a gas-based uh, heating system, as we are at the moment for most households, um, although rising after the falls of recent years. And then for many of the others, for most of the others, you see this big fall in gas demand. So in a sense, one of our conclusions is um, partly about um, electrifying heat, you know, low-carbon uh, low electricity is important for heat pumps, of course, but actually perhaps the bigger headline is the need to get out of gas. 
in a managed way and in a timely way and to reduce the amount of gas that's used or certainly unabated gas in the heating system as we go through the 2020s into the 2030s and that has all kinds of consequences both financially for the companies that uh, do that uh, for the infrastructures we need for gas because clearly we're going to still need those infrastructures as far away as 2040 and 2050 but we're not going to use them anywhere near as much so that's one of the big uncertainties that comes out there so that's a little bit about our gas for heating just have a quick time check so we can add in our system uncertainties there as well because clearly they also have impacts uh, of varying degrees depending on what kind of mix you have for heating and they also impact on transport so that's the final piece of my uh, jigsaw puzzle here so on transport over on the right hand side here I've put in electric vehicle costs and performance as an important determinant of whether we get transport sector decarbonisation in a timely way but also performance of other technologies again rather like heating um, electric vehicles have become the thing but there are things called hydrogen vehicles, there's potential for further generations of biofuels which perhaps don't have the impacts of first generation or they continue to be controversial. So again there are other options and again thinking about the demand side, you know, what about transport modes and reducing demand for transport in the first place. So again the story isn't just about electrifying the transport sector, there are uh, potential options that could be either combined with it or uh, perhaps come to dominate um, at the expense of electrification. I've just got a slide on that. Our work on that was quite focused and it really looked at the early adoption of electric vehicles by consumers and what were the uncertainties that were preventing further adoption in these very early days. I mean we do have some adoption in the UK but it's quite small still. It's still a very small percentage of the vehicle stock even though, as shown on the left-hand side, electric vehicles have been around for uh, over 100 years in uh, various kinds of guises, um, and they were certainly around in the early 20th century as well as the early 21st. And here they came up with three rather specific conclusions about that. One is about the financial incentives, not just for buying an electric vehicle, you can get a nice grant if you buy one, but actually those continuing incentives for ownership over time, if you're trying to look at this on a more life cycle basis. So the kind of tax breaks you get, reductions in congestion charges and so on, are they going to survive? Second, standardisation of payment mechanisms. Uh, people that they talked to said that well, they ended up having a whole wallet full of different cards for charging using different charging points and actually that standardization needs to happen which is very common in early stages of new technologies and then and then finally more robust methods for assessing performance actually have an agreed definition of um, how you assess the performance of the electric vehicle with respect to carbon emissions when compared to um, other alternative types of vehicle there's still quite a bit of uncertainty about how those methods are used and what kind of standard method could be used there so some quite specific recommendations about what the uncertainties were and what might be done. I think um, before I go on to the sort of solutions part, uh, or more onto the solutions part of my talk towards the end, I want to spend a bit of time talking about public attitudes and values, because clearly it's very closely linked to the kind of political debates we are now having about energy. Um, now, public attitudes and values is something that UKIRK has looked at over the past year or two, um, and certainly last year a team led by Cardiff University who contributed to this project tried to do something quite new and different, which was not just to consult people on what they thought of particular technologies or of a particular project, but actually to try and engage them in a conversation about energy system change as a whole. And what they did is ran a series of workshops and a large-scale uh, rep representative survey um, using the uh, partly the DEC My 2050 calculator to try and engage people in thinking about the trade-offs and their preferences in relation to system change, not with respect to individual technologies. So they had some nice uh, facilitated conversations, as exemplified by the, the, the slide there, and then came to some really quite important conclusions, some of which I'll, I've got on the next slide. But as we are uh, embarking on our third phase we're, um, in UK, we're also taking into account the fact that not all public attitudes and values can be managed in these nice um, uh, sort of uh, communal exercises or, and deliberative exercises of getting people involved. And clearly it gets very, very expensive, as my colleagues point out, to actually engage people in this very intensive way. And people want to engage in many different ways with the energy system. Um, one of my colleagues calls this unwelcome engagement, um, certainly from the point of view of some. Um, so these are some of my uh, 
uh, very polite uh, neighbours from Brighton. I think this was a, a nice uh, poster that was up uh, by Brighton Railway Station for a while last year. Um, and another very polite poster that was put in George Osborne's constituency about shale gas, which is an area of particular protest at the moment. So clearly, engagement doesn't mean uh, nice managed processes. Engagement also happens in other ways, and that's something that uh, may, um, our colleagues concluded, get more prevalent if the due processes aren't followed. Certainly you can't guarantee that kind of thing is not going to happen because clearly uh, some people are not going to like everything that is in a national or local energy strategy. So here are some of our conclusions on engagement. Um, one is that we still see far too often that public attitudes are framed very narrowly and it's the language of acceptance is used far too often. The idea that if only we explain better what the energy system ought to look like and what is good for people, in brackets, then they might accept it, rather than actually engaging them on what kind of energy system they would like to see. And, you know, to slightly defend the people who talk acceptance, engaging people on the system they'd like to see is not a simple thing to do. It's actually a very challenging thing to do. What we found in our work uh, last year, and what Nick Pigeon and his colleagues at Cardiff found, is that publics are often pragmatic about change, so if you really engage them in it, but they're unlikely to settle the change that's out of kilter with longer term values, and they actually detected a whole series of underlying values, so it's not really about technologies, it's more about values such as efficiency and not wasting things, and a, and a transition being seen to be fair. Um, and broader sustainability. So those are the sorts of things people continually talked about when they were thinking about whether they agreed with particular scenarios. They also concluded, and this came up a lot in the, uh, the field work they did, is that people aren't just interested in talking about the technologies and, and how a, a system is made up and what might happen to my house. They're equally interested in the whole issue of fairness and justice. Who pays for the transition? Um, how is it organized? Do I trust the people that are building the infrastructure? And so on. So those sorts of questions, which again we're going to look at in more detail in the current phase of UKIRK, came up again and again. And then finally, the area of what they called, in the end, non-transitions came up. So there are some areas where there was sort of conditional support. So if they were part of a broader strat strategy that met people's values, then actually fossil fuel use, carbon capture and storage and bioenergy were okay but they were all seen as problematic potentially in some way because they were using finite resources, carbon capture and storage perpetuates that even though it solves the CO2 problem in principle, largely at least, and bioenergy has well publicized um, ethical issues associated with it. So there are a set of options where you know, more conditional support was offered rather than wholesale support. Um, for some of the options in the mix. So I think that's important to something, exp important to explore further. So I've set out what the uncertainties were we've looked at. I've touched on what we found in broad areas. Now I'm going to just give you some examples of how we then followed that through into what ought to be done next and who uh, might actually take responsibility for that. Um, so I'm just going to give, I think, um, four or five examples. I won't go through all the uncertainties because there's too many to do in the time I've got. But what we did for each of them, um, so I'm giving you the example of commercializing low carbon electricity technologies here, is first identify how complex the uncertainty is. This is partly about how divergent people's views were about, for example, the costs of CCS or nuclear or offshore wind, but it's also about how the extent to which people really disagree about which of those technologies are a legitimate part of the low carbon transition. So that's orange on a kind of uh, traffic light system because there's a fair degree of contention still about what combination ought to be used. Clearly, if those uncertainties aren't resolved, the impact, which is the second dimension we looked at, would be very large, and so that's why that one is red. Actions were well, clearly long-term policy support. Some demonstration funding is still required in, for CCS. We're really emphasizing throughout our recommendations, not just for electricity, but for heat and transport as well, the importance of evaluations and learning. That's something I spent a lot of my time talking to uh, people in government about. They recognize this is important, but often it falls by the wayside, whether it's accidentally because institutional memory fades or because insufficient resources are attended to evaluating what's been done before, before embarking on a new policy or funding program. 
So clearly government and innovation funders, businesses and the research community all have a role to play there. So much of that action is actually being taken, but we did conclude perhaps more needed to be done to reduce those risks, particularly in the power sector. So that's one example. A second one is a much more narrow one, heat pump performance. The reason complexity is green is not because we've resolved everything, but it's because it's an individual technology where you've got some relatively well-known parameters and, er and ranges of uncertainty there. Um, but the impact is orange because clearly they're important in most of our scenarios that I showed you earlier but they're not absolutely essential in a central way in the way that low carbon electricity is to the low carbon transition. So again, we've got demonstration and deployment incentives, engagement with consumers, which is where some of the issues have arisen, and learning. So again, evaluation and learning as those heat pumps are uh, developed and commercialized. Again, a whole range of different people get involved here, including citizens and businesses. I've got a second slide which is really looking at the three systemic uncertainties. I'll probably put them all up together. I mean, what really strikes me about these is that there's a lot of red on this picture, and that's partly an indicator not only of how complex these uncertainties are, um, you know, predicting, for example, fossil fuel availability and price is a fool's game um, in the future. I mean, you can try, but I think it's very, very difficult to do, um, and it's very complex because it's um, impacted by a whole range of different factors. Ecosystem service impacts are red in complexity because of the lack of evidence base in many cases and public attitudes, again, because you've got lots of different views out there to capture. Impacts on the right, the reason the ecosystem one is orange is because probably those impacts are not seen as necessarily as important as some of the others uh, by some stakeholders, but clearly they can be very important when it comes to particular developments. So again, action, um, energy efficiency, diversity and carbon pricing for fossil fuels. The carbon pricing really is there because of really the need to hedge against the potential that we're actually heading for a low carbon, fo low fossil fuel price world in the next few years. And over the time that many of these strategies by DEC and CCC and others have been developed, the assumption has been really that we'll have high carbon, high fossil fuel prices, sorry, that they'd either stay high or they go even higher. Whereas now we're seeing signs, and I certainly wouldn't bet on it, because again, it's a fool's errand to predict these prices, um, that some prices are starting to fall, particularly gas prices over the next few years globally may start to fall. Um, so you really need to take action to shore up the rationale for going low carbon, because if those prices fall, clearly the gap between the economics of fossil and the economics of alternatives starts to get bigger. And that's the reason that's in there. Um, and here, genuine engagement with the public on energy system change, really going back to what we concluded about engagement and a whole set of people to be uh, acting there. So it's a very quick summary, but hopefully it gives you an idea of the kinds of things we, we, we looked at and the kinds of things we concluded. And this is certainly something we'd be um, interested in pursuing further in future. So just to uh, briefly wrap up, um, first on the power sector. So we say it's critically important, and that's not news. I think that's in common with many others, and certainly our own modeling as well as other people's modeling have showed that that 2030 timeframe for that is, is really important if we're going to decarbonize the entire energy system and economy over a longer term time scale. The capital point, there's no shortage, but policy frameworks, market structures, and business models may need to change to attract that capital. I think there's interesting consequences for the debate about competition in the generation sector and whether or not we need more transparency and more new entry into that sector. Because the point I didn't make earlier on is that many of the incumbent utilities, the EDFs, the EONs, and the Scottish powers of this world, are not in a brilliant position when it comes to investment at the moment. Uh, the balance sheets are weak, uh, they've got all sorts of things to deal with in their home markets because many of them are owned uh, by uh, host comp um, holding companies in other countries so you do need other sources of capital to come in. Second, the limited options to 2030 from the large-scale supply side. Clearly there are small-scale things which are starting to happen with things like solar but I think our point is it's tough to keep them all in the low carbon race, which is a phrase that uh, DEC has used in some of its documents. So there's a need for evidence-based decisions when priorities are eventually made. At the moment, government's showing no appetite, really, for an explicit sense of making priorities um, so far, although individual politicians may express views. More flexibility with heat and transport. Um, they can come a bit later. We've got a bit of time. 
delayed electricity carbonisation is not a showstopper for heat, but certainly would narrow the range of options we have. But in the meantime, what will really reinforce this more flexibility for heat and transport is more action on energy efficiency, particularly on the heat side, but also with respect to vehicle standards as well. And in the meantime, this real emphasis on demonstration, early deployment, and learning, not just about the new technologies, but also about rather familiar technologies which are not that common in the UK, such as uh, district heating, which is uh, by no means a new technology. There's a need to move beyond narrow framings of public attitudes um, and transitions that align with the values that we've uncovered we think are more likely to fly. Clearly that's not going to resolve all of the uncertainties and all the controversies there, but certainly the need to take that whole task seriously, both at a national level but also at a regional and local level where actually many of the, the sharp end of these debates starts to come out. And then finally, natural resources, ecosystem impacts may limit options and flexibility and that will potentially then feed back into some of these public controversies and debates. Of course they are driven also by global trends as well. So I'll leave it there. Um, I hope that was clear. Very happy to answer questions. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jim, for that uh, wonderful overview of pretty well all the major uncertainties that are facing uh, energy system choices and energy system decision makers uh, over the next couple of decades. Uh, questions, please uh, do say who you are, because we like to get to know you and where you come from uh, before you ask your question. Uh, there are a lot of people here, so by all means make a comment, but don't make a speech, and then ask a question. Thank you very much. <coughs> they do that. Hi, my name is Amy Mountain, I'm from the Green Alliance. Um, I was interested in what you're saying about the uh, evolution of the way that energy policy issues are thought about from climate change being the main thing, to then introducing security supply, to then later introducing mobility in this trilemma idea. And I was wondering on your thoughts of whether the trilemma is still the correct framing, particularly seeing as you flagged up um, public attitudes, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so the kind of attitudes and acceptability angle, whether that is, is important enough to be added to that trilemma, and then maybe you could also reflect on whether we have the institutional capacity to reflect the importance of that dimension as well, you know, mm. the CCC for the climate uh, part, we've got Ofgem uh, for affordability, Labour's talking about introducing the energy security mm. board, mm. you know, it, it, does there need to be more institutional space for reflecting the importance of public attitudes to the decarbonisation um, path? It's a very good question. I mean, a number of people have said the trilemma shouldn't be a trilemma. It should have four or five different legs. And I don't know what word you use, a quadrilemma or a whatever. You know, I'm probably uh, testing the English language to destruction um, a bit there. But, uh, you know, so you could add industrial policy objectives, for example, you know, jobs as part of, which many countries is a, is a part of energy policy here. It, never, it, it hasn't been, apart from more recently, at the edges. I'm not sure public attitudes qualifies quite like that, but I do think it's very, very important. And I do think institutionally you're right that uh, there's a need to engage at a level which is not it's not at get engaged at in the, at the moment I mean there are some good examples in the past where government has engaged quite well so if you go back as far as the 2003 energy white paper they actually went on on the road and engaged with people and discussed with people at town hall meetings what the strategy should be go forward to 2007 and it was the opposite it was very top-down and there wasn't a lot of consultation uh, there has been some engagement using the calculator and things like that so in places that it's there but I think institutionally you're probably right that there's something needs to happen and as I said in passing towards the end I not, don't necessarily think that's something for national government um, it's sort of for me potentially at least bound up with the whole debate about devolution and devolving power within England and within the UK uh, because many of these issues are local and regional and, and there seems to be a gap between the kind of very heated debates about a, one local development of say a fracking site near me in Balkan or a wind farm in mid Wales and the national conversation, but actually, where's the regional or local conversation to think about the energy choices of a particular region? On the um, Labour's Energy Security Board, I'm, I, I'm a bit of a sceptic, because I can't really see what it's for yet. If somebody can illuminate me, then that would be great, but uh, I, I think there are other structures there at the moment, so what, what I'm, my, my Im immediate reaction to that one is, is, why do we need one of those when we've got all these other bodies, um, and what is the problem it's trying to solve? But um, that's just for, for debate. I mean, the, the 
generation license have an explicit obligation to keep the lights on for the power generators, for example. So mm. you might think that ought to do the job. Uh, on the other hand, it might not. And of course, object might be abolished. But for that, the right back to the beginning, Jim, and your grasp about emissions targets mm. through the years. I think you're using a climate change committee. Yes, that's the CCC slide. Which yeah. is way below 100 grams per kilowatt hour. Yeah, it is. It's, I, I can't remember the exact number, but they, they always say between 50 and 100 or around, you know. It could, could be even lower. Yeah. DECA are using about 100 at the moment, mm. and I gather the Climate Change Committee are using, starting to use about 100 as well. Mm. That means that electrification is not going to cut it. Mm. What we're left with is efficiency. Yeah. Um, I can only agree with the statement and uh, I suppose note something I me again mentioned in passing earlier on which is that one casualty of the controversy over bills a year ago was that energy efficiency programs were downgraded which for me was the opposite of what the reaction ought to have been given that one way to reduce people's bills over the medium long term is to upgrade energy efficiency. So uh, I didn't quite understand that but it just was a casualty of the debate there. But I, I agree with your point, yes. Uh, George Day from the ECI. Um, Jim, I was uh, very struck by um, the point you were making about how tough it is to keep all of these technologies in kind of in the race. Mm. And um, you, you made the point that at some point uh, there's going to be some kind of priority setting. And what I'm interested in is kind of your thoughts on when that priority setting has to take place, given that. 2030 is only 15 years away, mm. and kind of in the context of the political environment you're sketching, um, how do you think that might crystallise? Mm. That's a very good question. Um, I mean, I think government has started the process of, 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 of at least developing a framework that can underpin such choices. I mean, uh, such choices clearly will be political judgments to make. I don't think you can do it in a sort of technocratic, expert-driven way, because these are political choices and trade-offs to make. But there are some bits of evidence now around some thing, a, a whole set of um, exercises called technology innovation needs assessments, which you'll be aware of, that have been done on the various technologies, trying to understand what impact they could have on our emissions, but also what impact they might have in industrially in terms of jobs, exports, all of those sorts of things. So in a way, government's identified the right sort of criteria. What it hasn't yet done is link that to where things might go. I mean, my feeling is um, that it, it isn't too far away when such choices can be made. I mean, if, if the one billion can be preserved, I do think it's still worth us going ahead and demonstrating carbon capture and storage, because frankly, the number of countries doing it around the world is quite small still. Uh, we can't just uh, rely on them popping up in North America and we may have to do it differently in the UK in terms of influencing countries like China, which is where you really want that technology to be commercialised. Um, and we also need to see what happens with the Hinkley C reactor, you know, which is uh, going in the wrong direction for all kinds of reasons in terms of its you know, potential delays and you know, looking at the costs of the design it's using and so on. So you know, the, the, the time might not be here yet, but certainly it ought to be here soon. Um, and for all we can assemble the evidence, I don't think I'm, I'm under any illusions that in the end it will be a political decision. Um, just the hope is that there's some uh, engagement with evidence on the way to making such decisions. And that it's not just, well, let's you know, get rid of the, the cheapest low carbon option, which is what some have started advocating, you know, which is onshore wind. Uh, Jim, let me ask a question, which, which has occurred to me as you're talking, mm. especially about jobs. Um, a piece of work I was involved with recently, which you also know about with Cambridge Economics, mm. is looking at the um, potential different economic implications of large-scale offshore wind deployment or large-scale gas deployment as two alternatives. And the economic outcomes were determined mm. almost entirely by the extent to which the UK developed supply chain yeah. Yeah. for these technologies. The assumptions were that we probably wouldn't develop UK supply chains for gas, because these supply chains are well established and they probably continue, but that we had the opportunity to develop supply chains mm. for offshore wind, and that if we did, the economics of offshore wind were transformed through the fact that we generated lots of jobs and economic activity. So my question to you about uncertainty is, uh, I know you didn't examine it in this project, mm. but what do you think about the uncertainties of the supply chain issues in the UK and how might they be resolved and 
what sorts of policy recommendations might one make if one wanted them to be resolved in the UK's favour? Yeah. So I think uh, the uncertainties, a lot of them are about, you know, the, the nature of those supply chains and the extent to which you will get part of those in the UK. I mean, most of the technologies you can think of are now global. Um, and they have been for a long time. So even the, the dash for gas and the UK power industry, most of the technology was, um, it was French, it was German, it was American. Um, but it was built here and service businesses were built here. So we got a bit of the supply chain here in those cases. Something where we're a first mover like offshore wind, my expectation would be that we get more of the supply chain. But I think in order to really capture those benefits, the UK probably has to become more like other countries, many other countries. Um, and you know, I'd think of South Korea or Germany or even China where there's that real linkage between, on, on one hand, economic and industrial policy, and on the other hand, energy policy, because those two things have kept, been kept quite separate in the UK. Uh, now, that's, of course, a risky thing to do, um, and that's partly why the, in UK policy it, it's not done so often, because people remember failures of trying to pick technologies and develop industries. Um, but I still think that is needed if we are going to capture those gains. But picking those technologies where we think we've got some particular sets of expertise to build on in related fields or where we think we're going to have some particular first mover advantages. And that's where offshore wind is, you know, is still an example because we are, I think, the biggest country for hosting offshore wind still in the world. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask you a bit more? Like about, you, sorry, yes. Anthony Edwards, architect. I uh, deal with uh, energy uh, retrofit on uh, existing buildings. Um, can you say a bit more about energy efficiency? Because mm. we're a bit of a loss to know where the government is going, much as in an election coming soon. The Green Deal was the Conservative government's uh, uh, primary policy. It was abandoned a few months ago. Seem to be mainly for the private for the private sector, uh, uh, mainly for sort of people replacing their worn-out boilers, which they've done anyway. Uh, the, the public sector. I mean, I know in this borough we're in here in Camden that uh, they have uh, 35,000 homes, and they say there's no way we're going to be able to do any e energy efficiency improvements unless the government gives us any. And there's no sign of that for at least. For at least, uh, at least five years ahead, there's no chance of getting any money. Mm. I mean, that sounds like most of this borough, and probably throughout the country. Could you say a bit more about energy efficiency? <coughs> where where uh, the motivation is going to come from for the government? Yeah. Whatever it is in, in, in the next year. I mean, you're right to point out that it does need motivation. So, you know, classically, if you look at uh, some models and analysis by people like McKinsey, you know, energy efficiency is all negative cost, and so people should just do it. Uh, but we know uh, from long experience and loads of research, not least in this building, that um, that's not the case. And there are all sorts of reasons why it's not implemented, even though it's going to save you money in, in quite short order for many uh, consumers. So you need to drive it through standards, you know, finance is needed, all kinds of other approaches. I mean, my sense uh, within government is that, um, I'll probably have to be a bit careful what I say, but um, there's certainly some thinking about um, the, the, long, the medium term future, in other words, beyond the next election, and thinking about what kind of energy efficiency policies might be needed, rather than just focusing on the policies we've got, by like Green Deal, Eco, and everything else, because Green Deal really hasn't delivered, um, uh, partly because it has such a high interest rate. and. Um, you know, many people pointed that out when it was introduced, but they went ahead anyway. So I think more, certainly more has to be done. And I think the thing you need to remember if people say, well, there aren't the resources to energy efficiency, is if, you know, if such programs are effective, then actually that's saving you from having to put other resources up, up the supply chain into, for example, the supply side of the power sector or into developing low carbon heat solutions. So it's not, it's not a, a sort of money you have to spend um, which is extra. It's actually instead of doing something else quite often. Um, and I think you know, developing better plans for how that can be done um, is, is really important. But I think the point that was raised by the controversy a year ago, which is that you know, we shouldn't be loading all of these costs onto energy bills because actually it adversely impacts the poor, I think that's fair enough. I think the risk of putting it on general taxation is every uh, year, every spring, the Chancellor can decide, oh, I don't want to spend money on that anymore. I'll, I'll cut it and spend my money on something else or, or whatever. So I think there are costs to taking it off energy bills, which is what's happened. But there's still quite a lot of low-cost measures which can be put in place. You know, the, 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 the lofts, the, the, the walls and so on. But soon we will get into more expensive measures. And that's where, you know, efficiency won't be cheap anymore. 
So I hope that helps a bit, but certainly, you know, the role of, I don't think we should underestimate the role of standards, really, is all I'd say, because they have actually... Yeah, more for new buildings. Yeah, well, for existing buildings. No. no. Of the buildings that need improving, and then, in fact, a tiny proportion of mm. the use of the power stations, yeah. electricity and gas for both. Gentleman here. Mm. Uh, Martin Hay from the oh, yeah. Johnson Norris team at OGM. Mm -hmm. I just sense with this that we see the uncertainty sort of fanning out, mm -hmm. getting wider and wider as we go further mm -hmm. ahead. And I just wondered whether in your work, whether that seemed to be the case all the time. The further out you look, the more uncertain, the, the, the wider the spread that was possible. Or whether there were ways in which you thought, ah, oh, no, maybe actually it has a certain sort of shape the further out you go. And one of the ways that that's often portrayed is a path dependency that can cause yeah. sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, I wondered whether you know you felt that some things might cluster in the long run in terms of uncertainties rather than just being all out there, or whether you, there were things that you could say about how to narrow the range in the long mm, run. Mm, I mean, one of the mm. things about the path dependency, you seem to, you know, heat and transport are particularly often afflicted by this. Mm. Yeah. And of course, your advice is well, we could do with more options, mm. which is to sort of get away from the path mm. dependency. Mm. So I suppose, in a way, you could say that's broadening the uncertainty in one way, but it's obviously wanting to reduce, wanting to reduce our vulnerability to that. Yeah, yeah. Can you say anything about this? Sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Long run as a yeah. I think there's definitely a balance here at different periods through this, you know, time to 2030 of, you know, opening up options because actually you need more, develop more options and deciding actually that's the option you're going to go for and close down, you know, which is, which is, which is George's point. So in, in, I think in the power sector, clearly at the meta level, we've chosen the option which is go low carbon, but at the individual mix level, we haven't got to that point yet, but at least that's a bit more bounded, you know, and it's a question if you believe that that's what we need to do and not everybody does, of course, then it's a question of which technology combination you need. Whereas, you know, from our view, which I think comes out in the conclusions for heat and transport, is that things are a bit more open. But I think it's common for system changes to kind of open up in complexity before they close down. And I think the point about heat, just to take one example, is that perhaps you might see um, some closing down, but not on a national level. I hear people saying, oh, we'll have to choose which low carbon heat option we have for the UK as a whole and for me that doesn't really make sense because we haven't done that hitherto. I mean many places are on the gas grid but in some areas of the country there was a choice made not to build the gas grid you know outside major cities and conurbations so they're on oil or they're on uh, other other forms of heating and my feeling is that actually I probably reflected quite well in some of DEC's more recent heat strategies that you know for different regions you'll probably get new um, different forms of path dependency so if you have an area where heat networks really start taking off, um, you know, so, so com some cities like, um, I talk about Aberdeen or Newcastle and some others, where there's a momentum behind it, they've started doing a lot, then that might end up as the dominant way of doing things, whereas in others, it may not. So I think that diversity is partly to allow those more regional or local path dependencies to take hold, rather than trying to impose right from the top a single path dependency. So I suppose one outcome which definitely needs more exploration is just that, that, that again, coming back to the subnational level. Um, I haven't completely resolved your question at all, but I think you're, you're, you're quite right. Path dependency will be important at some point. And it may not always be designed. It might just be the path dependency emerges. And, and then the, you know, there's not much policy you can actually do about it. A very interesting potential links to the evolution agenda mm. um, and the rise, perhaps, of community mm. energy and municipal energy. We're sort of winding down, I sense, or winding up to go upstairs, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. There's a question down here. Is there anyone else absolutely desperate to ask a question while you've got Jim in your sights? You may not. Lady here, and then we'll uh, call it a day. Yeah. Um, you said there was a need for new entrants, and given how difficult the utility industry is to crack open mm. in the UK, um, what kind of new entrants are you seeing, if any, and mm. which part of the system that they fit into? Mm. Mm. So there's quite interesting things going on. I mean, just because we hosted a talk by them uh, a couple of weeks ago, Ovo Energy, I mean, uh, you know, just listening to their story of eye-watering rates of growth of customers, I mean, they're still a very small supplier, but they've grown extremely fast since they were founded five years ago. And at least 
if you were to take at face value what the CEO said, you know, quite a different business model. You know, they're not interested in being a generator. They're really interested in engaging with community groups and acting as a, as a, as a version of the Amazon, I forgot what it's called, but the Amazon marketplace. You know, he talked about that sort of analogy. So that was kind of interesting. I mean, it remains to be seen how that will be put into practice. So that's one area where you're seeing the business model. And clearly, that sort of business model may help investment, but investment at the much more local level, you know, the community groups and the local energy. At the same time, you're then seeing some quite interesting developments of invest di new investors coming into the generation market, but at the very high level, which actually have been present for ever since the Dash for Gas. I remember when I was following the Dash for Gas, you got all kinds of uh, wealth funds and investment. Uh, pension funds from Canada and all kinds of places investing in power stations then. So that isn't new, but you know, speculation about Chinese, well, agreement of Chinese environment and now speculation about potentially other countries coming in to the Hinkley Sea deal. So there's a diversity of different companies offering, operating at different levels. But I do think in terms of the generation market, which is now, well, the utility market, which has now been referred to the Competition Commission, one of the big issues is vertical integration. And it's very difficult for new entrants to get in. My own personal view is that they do need to be split up so you have generation separate from retail and a proper functioning wholesale market rather than this market which is basically the residual after everybody's traded most of the energy with themselves which really doesn't help transparency in getting the new entrants in. So I think there's quite a long way to go and actually a bit of a note of caution because we've always been wondering about new entry ever since privatization happened 20 years ago and it, it you know I think OVO is one of the first times I've genuinely seen you know something growing at that kind of speed which looks new as I said it remains to be seen whether that really turns out to be the case. Can I just ask one very quick supplementary question? Mm. Absolutely. Um, do, you, do you want to say who you are? Say oh, you yes, are. sorry. I'm Felicity Carey, so I'm a, a sustainability communications consultant. Um, so, um, sorry, the, the, the question really uh, for me is are you seeing any monetization of energy efficiency? Uh, I've seen models in the US where this is happening, mm -hmm. um, but to actually leverage that capital to actually make those changes physically to a building, whatever. Um, I don't see so much of that happening in the UK. Some on the edges, so you're seeing some of the aggregators who are um, doing things not in the domestic sector, actually in the more commercial sector, so helping to bal balance supply and demand and selling services based on customers that can ship their demand around. Now that's something which can come to the domestic sector in the future as we all get smart meters and it's something that's being trialled as part of the capacity market, you know, which is designed really to give us enough capacity. But in my view, and I think uh, my colleagues in Newkirk have said this many, many times, that the design of that market is very much still weighted towards incentivizing new power stations to balance supply and demand and not a more neutral process which says it doesn't matter how you balance supply and demand we want the cheapest way to do it which in principle would bring in more demand side and monitors and start to monetize as you term it some of those benefits uh, for them so I think again we've got quite a long way to go and in the way that the reforms have been implemented in, in for the electricity market in particular there's still that very historic path dependent to use your word supply side uh, I, I don't know whether bias explicitly is the right word, but certainly it's very oriented towards supply side solutions rather than saying, well, we want the cheapest way to decarbonize. So uh, there's more that we, we could do. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. <laughs>